So I wanted to make this video to address an erroneous view that many professing Christians hold in regards to the judgment of God. Many professing Christians believe that there will be nothing to fear on the day of judgment. That because they are true believers, that they won't have any reason to fear on that day. That is a foolish and ignorant train of thought. What it truly reveals is that the person has no idea of who God is. To the people who hold to that false view, here's a question. Moses, being God's chief man at the time, in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, did Moses have anything to fear when he came down from the mount before the presence of the Lord? Was he fearful? Was he fearful at all? Isaiah, being the most righteous man of the land at the time, did he have any reason to fear? Was he fearful when he came out from the presence of the Lord? It amazes me how these men, who are far much more righteous than we are, trembled at the thought of treating the Lord as something that's commonplace, as though it's nothing, he's nothing to fear, because they feared. I just read in Exodus 33 where the Lord declares to Moses regarding the disobedient children of Israel, I will come before you in a moment and consume you. And you people say, oh, that's just the Old Testament. People, It's amazing how people treat the Old Testament like it doesn't matter, like it's, it's something that's no longer relevant. It's amazing. It's not the Old Testament. It's not just the Old Testament. It's every single day. Do you know how many people die every single day? 150 to 200,000 people die daily. I get notifications on my phone. A building in Iran collapses and 74 people are dead. Who takes credit for those deaths? God does. Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I, even I, am he and there is no God besides me. I kill and I make alive. So away with this idea that we are Christians, we have nothing to fear. Anyone that holds that train of thought, I'm hard pressed to believe that they are a true Christian to begin with. But for the sake of argument, let's say that they are. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in this body, whether good or evil. Listen, that day for the true believer will be absolutely glorious, but it will also be absolutely terrifying. I want you to know something. God is a God who is angry every day as we slaughter children. As we live as though he were not. As there is no fear and no understanding. As we are vipers and our children are like hatched vipers. As the world tumbles down into an insanity and an immorality. As it declares war on God. As we murder the innocent. As we destroy virtue. As we take a knife and stab it right into the heart of everything that is beautiful. As we vomit out our iniquity. Yes, God hates. How does it work? Imagine this. God in his justice looking at humanity. God in his justice looking at you. Do you realize that if I could pull out your heart right now and put it on a CD or some sort of video player and show it every thought you've ever thought, even what you're thinking right now, and play it before this congregation of people, you would run out of here and you'd never show your face here again? Everything God knows. And it's as though the justice of God is crying out for your damnation. And with one hand, the mercy of God is holding back his wrath. And with the other hand, the mercy of God is beckoning you to come to salvation before it is too late. But I can assure you, my friend, one day the offer will be taken back. And there will be no offer of salvation and the hand of God's mercy will be withdrawn and there'll be nothing left for you throughout eternity except the wrath of almighty God, the holy hatred of God against all your evil. You said, well, how then can we be saved? The Puritans would have said it this way. How can the mercy of God and the righteousness of God be reconciled now? I want to take you on a little Bible lesson, and I want you to see this problem for yourself very clearly. First of all, go to Exodus 34. Now listen, 
Exodus 34. This is one of the greatest revelations of God in the Old Testament. God comes down and speaks for himself. It says in verse 5 of chapter 34 of Exodus, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him, with Moses, and he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, the Lord, Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands. So far, so good. This is beautiful. And then he goes on, it even gets better who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. He's not trying to give us a, a study in Hebrew here. He's heaping one term upon another to say that this God forgives all types and kinds of sin. But then look, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Hold it. That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? He forgives all types and kinds of sin, but everyone who is guilty of sin, they will be punished. They will. How do you work that out? He forgives all types and kinds of sin. Everyone who has ever committed a sin will be punished. And punished precisely, justly. And you say, how does that work? Here's what you need to see. God will punish every sin that has ever been committed. He will punish every sin you have ever committed. And there's one of two ways in which he'll do it. He will punish every sin you have ever committed as you spend an eternity in hell cast out of the presence of God and positively suffering the full force of his wrath. That's one way in which he will punish every sin you've ever committed. But there's another way. For those who trust in Christ, he punished every one of their sins on his son when he hung on Calvary and he crushed his own son under the full force of the wrath that you and I would deserve throughout an eternity in hell. Your sins are going to be punished, every one of them. My sins are going to be punished, every one of them. The question is, how do you want to do this? And go to hell throughout all eternity. Or look to the one lifted up like a serpent in the wilderness, bearing your sin and crushed under the holy hatred of God in your place.